if you've ever been in a train, a plane, or a car, you can thank your momentum to gears. It's how we step up torque, and we've been using these things for thousands of years. Now. Over the centuries, we've advanced these gears to look a lot better and be a lot more precise, and there's all sorts of different gears out there, but today, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna make spur gears using a hob like this. So in order to understand what is actually going on here a little bit better, let's pretend that the tool right here, the cutting hob, is a mating part. It's actually just a screw. And as this spins, it rotates the gear. So when you're watching the cutting footage, just pretend for a second you're watching a screw drive a gear. Now, all we do is we add cutting teeth into that screw and you got yourself a hob. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's basically a good way of looking at what's going on here. So before we go into how to actually use a hob, I wanna explain some things about gears. It'll make understanding what's actually going on a lot simpler. So with the gear, you have a few things you need to know. Right here, I drew a nice 2D version of a spur gear. Now, what is a spur gear? A spur gear is simply when the teeth go straight on a gear. You have helical gears, you have he herringbone gears, you have all sorts of different types of gears, but in this video, we're only doing spur gears. So that is what a spur gear is. So a nice 2D image of that would look something like this. Now, the outside diameter of your gear is just simply the top of your gear, but the diameter you're really gonna measure a lot of things in most of the time is going to be your pitch diameter, and it works just like a thread. It's a diameter that goes through the middle of the gear that tells you, well, what its pitch diameter is. And we're gonna use this later to make our gearbox. Now, from the middle to the top is called the addendum. And from the middle to the bottom is called the dedendum. Now, this is gonna change depending on what diameter gear you're making. The bigger the gear, the straighter these will become. Now, if you make your gear flat, which is called a rack, you will actually have no addendum and dedendum that you can see on a flat gear. This is also what your hob is gonna look like. Now, obviously in order to make a gear, we can't have something 200 feet long to roll through our parts. So that's why we make our hobs round and helical so we can spin the hob and the gear to create the form of our gear. But again, if you look at these gears closely, you'll notice the smaller brass part I did compared to the bigger aluminum part looks different, but it's done with the same hob. And that's why they can mate like that. So other than that, all you need to know for your gear is your hold depth. Your hold depth is just gonna be your addendum plus your dedendum. So it's basically from the bottom of the gear, the root of your gear, to the top of the gear. Nothing too crazy there, but I want you to understand that about gear hopping. When you're watching this machining footage, you need to know that the reason why your gear has an addendum and a dedendum is because the way, well, just hobbing works. If you take our gear right here and you push it up into this poorly drawn picture of a hob that I did here, you can see at different points of the hobbing process, different parts of the hob will be touching different parts of the gear. And that's what's gonna create this shape. So again, the bigger the gear, the less you're gonna notice this, smaller the gear, it's gonna be a lot more profound. Just want to give a quick shout out to Helios. Thank you so much. They've sent us lots and lots and lots of dollars worth of hobs. I really appreciate it. They, they really have been unbelievably great at helping us out, understanding how the hobs work, teaching me all this math to make me sound smart on camera. I appreciate all that. So thank you so much. If you need any gear hobbing done, make sure you check out Helios because yeah, they hooked us up for free in this video and I am, uh, I'm grateful for that. So thank you. How do you calculate all this stuff? Well, look at that, a dry erase board full of math. Would you expect anything less from one of my videos? So all the gears you're gonna see in this video were done using a hob with a diametrical pitch of 28. And with that diametrical pitch, we can figure out all the dimensions of our gear. Now, one quick thing here, don't confuse diametrical pitch with pitch diameter. Those are two completely different things. Our pitch diameter is gonna change depending on what the size of our gear is. Our diametrical pitch will always be the same. So, 
we have a diametrical pitch of 28 and we want to calculate our addendum. So on a fine gear, we're going to take one and we're going to divide it by our diametrical pitch. So one divided by 28 is 0.0357. So that's going to be the top half of my gear, how big that is. For the dedendum, we're going to take 1.2 and divide it by our diametrical pitch and add two thousandths. So one divided by 28 plus 0.002 equals 0448. That's going to be our dedendum, the lower half of our gear. Again, you add both those together to get our whole depth, you're going to get 08005. So the depth of all these teeth is 08005. Just some you know useful stuff to know when you're making gears. You kind of want to understand where all this stuff is coming from. Now we need to figure out our pitch diameter. Well, if you're going to do any kind of gear hobbing, typically the person who's going to send you a blueprint is going to figure this out for you. They're just going to give you like an amount of teeth and a pitch diameter. So we're going to use that information here. So we're going to, it's going to tell us our amount of teeth divided by our diametrical pitch is actually going to equal our pitch diameter. Now, again, this will normally be calculated for you, but it's good to know this math because people get things wrong all the time in engineering. So it's good to know how to do a lot of this stuff because I have gotten prints where someone has sent a gear that can't even be possibly made. So again, it's good to double check this stuff before you try to order a hob, before you try to make a part, double check this stuff. Now these next couple things is what we're gonna need to know as programmers to program our part in our machine. So we're gonna CNC machine a gear. That means from the side here, if you look at it, I'm gonna have to turn a profile. I'm gonna have to turn this top diameter. So this top diameter is gonna be turned. It's not gonna be formed by the gear hob. It's gonna be turned by our turning tool. So what is that diameter? Well, in order for us to calculate that, we'll take our pitch diameter, we'll add our addendum times two to get our top diameter, which is 1.1071. Now, what I did to touch off my gear hob is I just took my hob and I touched the side of my part like this. Well, it'll actually be like this, but I don't wanna get the gear to go in there. So I touched my top diameter with my hob and I set that at 1.1071, which is the top diameter. Now in my program, I'm gonna to need to know the bottom of the gear tooth. How far am I gonna go down in X to actually achieve the right dimension? So I took the pitch diameter, you minus the dedendum times two, which is the lower half of your gear times two, and you'll get your root diameter. So the bottom of this gear, at the very, very bottom, it should be 946.1. Okay, so the last thing, the very last thing you need to know to hob on a Swiss machine is the G code to make your live tool run in perfect sync with your main spindle. You can't just fire two RPMs. The machine's not gonna keep in sync well enough to actually create a good gear. You need to fire a G code that's going to make sure that absolutely it is going to stay in perfect sync. So this is gonna be G51.2. Now this is the same code I use to do polygon turning. And it pretty much is doing the exact same thing as polygon turning. It's just keeping one thing in sync with the other at a specific ratio. So the first thing we're gonna say is our main spindle revolution. So this is just gonna be P1. So every one revolution of the main spindle I want my hob to spin 29 times. Now, where did I get 29 from? That's the amount of teeth I'm gonna make. So I'm gonna make 29 teeth on my gear. That is going to be my Q value. You fire that and you command M103 S100 P1. It's gonna tell my main spindle to rotate at 100 RPM. Then I fire this G code right here and it will spin the hob at 2900 RPM, which is kind of ridiculous, but this is where the limitations of hobbing really come into play quickly here. You can't spin your main spindle at 4,000 RPM, even if you're machining brass, because your hob will have to spin at like 100,000 RPM to keep up with that, and that'll just melt anything. So whenever you watch footage of hobbing, that's why it's going so slow, because the hob has to spin so much faster than the gear itself. So it looks slow when you're watching it, but it's actually incredibly fast how quick this is forming the shape of that gear. Okay, 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 I lied. There's actually one more thing I wanna talk about here before we're done, and that is your feed rate and how it will affect the way your gear looks. So if you feed at 10 thou per rev, you will actually see a line at the bottom of the gear every 10 thousands, but you won't see lines on the sides of the gear. And that's because the way the gear hob works. Because the way it rotates with the gear and is making contact the whole time as it goes through the part, you won't see feed rate lines on the sides of your gear. You'll only see them at the bottom. So for example, if you look at this brass part here, the lines you're seeing at the bottom are every 10 thousandths because that was what my feed rate was. I moved 10 thousandths per revolution of the gear hop. Now, if you go fast enough, you can actually see these lines on the walls of your gear, but you have to go incredibly fast to achieve that.
The last thing we have to talk about here is the angle of your hob. You don't just put your hob in perpendicular to your spindle. You actually have to rotate it at an angle. But which way do you go? Well, looking at my hob and pretending I'm the part, I could see the helix of my hob is going up like this. So I need to rotate it this way to get the proper clearance angle of my hob. Now, what angle is that? Well, unless the manufacturer of your hob is a total jerk, it should be written on the side of your hob. Luckily, Helios always puts the angle you need to put your hob at on the side of your hob, which is very, very nice. Um, but yeah, basically you put it at that angle and it doesn't matter what diameter you're doing, the hobs angle is always gonna be the same. So when I did this big gear right here and this small gear right here, it was the same hob at the same angle. I just used two different machines. I did one on the SMX and I did one on the Swiss Deco. Now that's how I achieved both these gears. Now, if you're doing hobbing on a B-axis Cato style lathe, that's incredibly easy. You can just program your B-axis to be at whatever angle you want. Nothing too tricky there. But if you're using a turret like me, you're gonna need something a little bit crazier, and that is a hobbing holder. So on a typical turret lathe, you're gonna need a hobbing holder because we don't have a real good way to rotate a B axis or anything like that. I get it on the Swiss Deco we do, but that's not gonna be rigid enough. You're gonna have to use a holder like this. Now, so if you look at the hob we use to make all these gears, there's a 28 diametrical pitch hob, and it actually says on it, one degree, eight minutes. Can you see that? Okay, so one degree, eight minutes. So how do we do that? Well, if you look at the side of our gear hob, we have degrees and then we have decimals. So you will have to convert minutes to decimals or decimals to minutes, depending on how your gear hob holder comes to you. Some will come with minutes, some will come with a decimal size angle. It's confusing, I know, but hey, the world's never gonna standardize on this stuff, so just get used to it. So down here is degrees and up here is decimals. So if I were to do one degree and eight minutes, well, in decimal, one degree, and then you just take eight and divide it by 60. So eight divided by 60. 0.1333, so one degree in eight minutes is one degree 0.133. So I'm gonna rotate this. So down here, I'm gonna be at one degree. So I'm gonna line my zero up with one. Now up here is gonna be 0.1, so I need to move this, this guy right here to match that one right there. And that's 1.1. It's incredibly difficult to see. I, I'm sure you came up because of this, but yeah. The first one's my degrees, the second one's my decimal, right? So when I get it in line with one degree, the zero is gonna be in line with that line right there. But the next one's 0.1, that right there is 0.1, because right there is 0.5. So now I, you could see maybe, I don't know if you could see it on the camera, but how this, these two lines aren't in line. Well, I need to get that moved with the secondary scale there. And that right there is roughly 1.133 degrees. Once you get that set, Tighten these screws in the back here, and there you go. Your hob is now in place. I know it's a little confusing. Unfortunately, you don't always get a B axis that you can just rotate and program and have a you know easy going life. Sometimes you have to figure this stuff out. Just know some of your holders are gonna come in decimal, some of your holders are gonna come into minutes. If you want to convert minutes into decimal, just take whatever minute you have and divide it by 60. And that will give you the decimal equivalent. So after you get this set up at the angle you want, you're gonna have to put it in your machine. But before you do that, you're gonna to want to throw your hob on there. So your hob should go on just like that. There we go. Okay, so I got the hob to go on there. Now with hobbing comes a lot of precision. And if you just had something like this sticking out where that could like wobble around like that, you'd have a lot of problems. So what they do is you actually secure and your hob on Keith just comes through my department. I'm at the point where, you know what, dude, if you want to be in my videos that bad, Keith, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just come through my department, keep talking. I don't care. So we got the nut on now. And then after that comes the support. Now this is going to give the hob support on both sides. So once you get that on, you can tighten these two screws. And there you go. That is about as rigid of a setup as I honestly can think to create. You are supported on both ends. Now one cool thing to note here is if you actually look at the hob closely, you can see what I was talking about. You can see there's brass on like four teeth. Okay, and that is why this shape is getting created. The hob has straight teeth like this, but you can see from looking at the hob, you can see the evidence of how the gear contacts on multiple teeth. You can actually see, if I take this little guy right here and run it through, you can actually see the hob is touching on multiple teeth. But do you see how there's brass on like four teeth right there that I can wipe off? Those are the teeth that are actually contacting that gear. Pretty cool stuff, honestly, hobbing is, Incredibly fascinating. I really cannot believe that they patented this in like 1889. It's like 1889 or 1896. I honestly, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But um, the fact that people figured this out over 120 years ago is just crazy.
Well, that is it for our video today, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. I find gears to be incredibly fascinating. That's why I did this entire video. If you liked it, make sure you hit that like button. Also subscribe and um, yeah, ring that notifications bell. See ya.